Hey, welcome again, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is Joey Lovestrand. I'm a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at SOAS, University of London, and currently hosting this series of webinars on behalf of the Linguistics Department. Our speaker today is Ares Levin, and he is a professor of sociolinguistics at the University of Bern, whose work focuses on how people produce and perceive socially meaningful patterns of variation in language. Ares was also previously a professor of sociolinguistics at Queen Mary University of London, so it's familiar with the, the London university scene and uh, uh, a neighbor of SOAS for many years. I first came across Ares's work when I was reading about the new laws in France regarded to linguistic discrimination and began wondering if any such laws existed in the UK. And searching through these questions about dialects and discrimination, I came across the Accent Bias in Britain Project website. Uh, I was quite curious about what was going on, so I was really happy that Ares accepted to join us to present his work, so I didn't have to do the reading. He could <laughs> present it for us. Uh, Ares will present for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll use the remaining time in our hour together to take questions from participants. You can ask questions by writing them in the chat at any time during the presentation, or if you'd like to ask the question yourself, you can signal that by saying so in the chat or by using the hand raising function in Zoom. So with that introduction, Ares, thank you so much for joining us today and putting this presentation together. And we look forward to hearing what you have to share with us. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. It's, it's really nice to be able to sort of be in London in a sense and, and be able to, to talk about this work. Yeah, so as, as Joey said, um, I'm gonna be talking about a project that, that I and some colleagues have been working on, looking at accent bias um, and sort of attitudes to accent variation in, in the UK. Um, and, and I would very much like to, to be able to link this to, to what has recently happened in terms of legislation in France or what may be happening in other countries later. Um, hopefully we can bring that up in the discussion. So during what I'll be presenting to you, it'll be focusing mainly on the project that, that we've been doing. So in, in a very famous quote by, by George Bernard Shaw that, that some of you will already know, um, he says that the moment an Englishman opens his mouth, another Englishman despises him. And, and this quote we, we think is a good testament of the extent to which British society is and has historically been incredibly socially stratified along a number of different dimensions, but particularly in relation to, to issues of social class and social positioning. And we know that this stratification in terms of ideologies and systems of attitudes and beliefs has led also to longstanding patterns of inequality in professional hiring throughout the UK. And even very recent research has attested to this these persistent patterns of inequality in professional hiring. We also know as, as linguists and as sociolinguists that accent itself is a key signal of social background. And so could itself be one of these things that's linked to these patterns of, of inequality that we find socially and specifically within uh, employment contexts. But the specific role of accent in perpetuating these kinds of unequal outcomes in, in the UK today has been underexplored. So there have to date been no large scale surveys of accent attitudes in the UK that are using, that have used audio stimuli and certainly no recent ones. There are a couple examples, for example, that you see here on the slide from, from Howard Giles and colleagues work, that this was sort of around 50 years ago, more recently, a smaller scale study by Haraga, but nothing uh, more recent looking at what are the attitudes that people have in the UK today. And we also have very little understanding of how these attitudes vary by the different contexts in which we encounter language and speech. So employment context versus more informal context and so on and so on. And so it's precisely these kinds of gaps and these kinds of questions that we set out to investigate in uh, the Accent Bias in Britain project. Uh, so this is a project that is, is still ongoing. It, it, it officially ends, the funding at least ends uh, later on this year in August of, of 2021. It was a collaboration between uh, Queen Mary University of London, where, where it's my former institution, as well as the University of York. And it involved colleagues in uh, linguistics as well as in uh, social psychology and in the law school because we decided to focus on on the sector of law as the professional context that we would be that we would be looking at. And what we were trying to do in this project overall is, is to try and get a, a fairly deep uh, understanding of what are contemporary attitudes to different dimensions of accent and accent bias throughout the UK. Um, and to do this among a variety of different uh, publics, 
uh, sort of listener publics and as well as um, test different kinds of interventions and, and ways in which we can try and combat any bias that we find. What I'm going to be talking about uh, today is really going to be focusing on the first three studies that are listed here, so attitudes to accent labels, so just concepts for accents. If I give you a, an accent name, such as Birmingham English, uh, what are the attitudes that, that members of the UK general public have to that? Then attitudes to audio examples of these different accents, once again, amongst, amongst the general public. And then finally, a similar study of, of reactions to audio stimuli, but this time among a, a target a listener population of recruiters in, in the legal profession. And the reason that we're interested in these three studies in particular is because of the ways in which we find, and it's sort of a preview of what I'm going to be talking about, is we find that patterns of bias become attenuated as we become progressively more contextualized and progressively more situated in particular uh, interactional contexts. And so I'll both be sort of presenting the overall results of what we found in, in these three studies, and then also trying to situate those within a broader theoretical understanding of what accents are, uh, how people or how they become generated in, in specific interactional moments, and use that as a way to, to start a discussion then about how we might want to go about combating the kinds of, of bias that, that we are finding. Okay, so let me start off by, by jumping into the first study. And again, this is a study of attitudes to accent labels, so just a particular concept related to an accent. And here we're very much relying on and replicating work that was done by Bishop uh, Coupland and other colleagues in, in 2000, published in 2005, as well as earlier work that was done by Giles and colleagues and published in 1970. What we did was we recruited a nationally representative sample of the UK public. So we worked with a market research firm to create a sample that would be representative in terms of a regional distribution, gender distribution, uh, ethnic distribution, and age distribution uh, throughout the UK. So 180, 27 respondents. And what all, uh, sorry, 827 respondents. And what all of these respondents uh, were presented with were 38 labels for different accents of English. And for each label, they were simply asked to indicate how prestigious they thought this accent sounds and how pleasant they think this accent sounds. And this is precisely the, the methodology that was used by Bishop and colleagues in, in the 2005 study. And if we look at and compare our results to those of, of uh, Bishop and colleagues, so I'm listing it here as 2004, because that's actually uh, when the data was collected and then published in 2005. We find that at the top of the ranking, so if we produce a ranking from 1 to 38 of all the accents, at the top of the ranking, we see a huge amount of stability between the findings from 2004 to the findings of 2019. And I should say here that I'm showing you uh, the rankings for prestige. I'm just going to be focusing on prestige because that's most directly linked to, to uh, the employment context that we're interested in. So in 2019, as in 2004, when asked, uh, respondents essentially said that Queen's English was the most prestigious, followed by a standard accent of English. Further down, we have my own accent of English, and then a variety of different national and or inner circle varieties of English. So New Zealand English, Edinburgh English, Australian English, and so on and so on. And what's interesting here is how stable we think is interesting how stable um, this is between the, the two time points. So this is what's happening at the top of the prestige hierarchy. When we look at the bottom of the prestige hierarchy, we find <clears throat> a very similar pattern of stability. Now it looks like there are a lot of downward trend lines here, but actually that's because we were looking at 38 accents and Bishop and colleague, uh, colleagues only looked at 34. So for example, we split up what they had as one category of London, we inserted Cockney and Essex and things like that. So we made that slightly more articulated. So again, actually what we're finding is a great deal of stability and that what's sitting at the bottom of this hierarchy is for example, Birmingham coming in last place in, in our survey as it did in 2004, as well as a variety of other industrial accents in the UK. So Newcastle, Glasgow, Liverpool, and a variety of, of uh, ethnic accents or accents that arise from uh, migration patterns in the UK. So Afro-Caribbean and Indian, for example. So 
The overriding theme then that what we're finding in, in this first study, again, and this is just a study of people's overall ideologies about these accent concepts, is that there is this very strong enduring hierarchy of prestige that I've shown you before from 2019 to 2004. But when we actually go even further back to the Giles study in 1969, we see a similar kind of, of uh, stability across essentially a half century time span. So in the original Giles study in 69, there were just 14 accents that were investigated. And if we plot the results just for those 14 accents at these three different time points, we can see that the ranking hasn't really changed at all. So the 1969 ranking is in, in gold, the 2004 ranking in green, and then our replication in 2019 is in blue. And we see that once again, highest rank, top ranked, are these various national and inner circle varieties of, of English. And then we have industrial and ethnic varieties of English at the bottom. The one change that we do identify is that the, the uh, sort of relative contrast between the accents in 2019 seem to be narrower than they were in earlier time points. So the blue, the slope of the blue line is somewhat flatter than it was in 1969 or 2004. So people aren't differentiating the accents quite as much. But nevertheless, we still see this overall hierarchy that is the same hierarchy that has been around for the past 50 years. Now, just one uh, additional thing that I want to, to signal about the results from the label study is that we found a very significant effect of age. And this is similar also to what uh, Bishop and colleagues found in, in their 2004 study. So a third of the accents that we tested showed a significant age difference with essentially listeners under the age of 45 uh, rating all of the accents uh, more highly than listeners over the age of 45. And Coupland and Bishop, in a discussion of their uh, earlier findings from the 2004 study, also found a similar pattern and indicated that this seems to indicate that young people are somewhat less embedded in the conservative ideology of positively evaluating standard accents. And Coupland and Bishop questioned then whether, though, they wondered if, if the age effects that they were finding were indicative of some kind of attitudinal change. Could it be that, you know, the reason that we're seeing that younger people are, are rating these accents, these, these non-standard accents more highly, is because attitudes are changing? They were somewhat skeptical of that, and we are even more skeptical of that, given that we've essentially replicated this pattern 15 years later, so nearly a generation year, uh, later, and we're finding the same kind of pattern. And when we really dig into that pattern, what we see is that uh, there are differences in terms of which accents it is that, that young people versus older people are ranking more highly than others. I realize that there, there's a lot of information on this plot, so let me just walk you through the bullet points. Essentially, younger respondents are giving higher ratings to foreign and ethnic accents, so those are the, the lines in green, and working class and industrial accents, those are the lines in blue, than older respondents are. Whereas in contrast, older respondents give higher ratings to UK national and traditional rural accents, so things like Edinburgh, Scottish, and West Country. And again, this parallels what, what uh, Bishop and colleagues found in their 2004 data. And this is what really makes us think that what's happening here is not actually real-time attitudinal change. Instead, it appears to be more like age grading. And we really see this as a pattern of emerging normativity in midlife. It seems that indeed, like Kukulin and Bishop say, young people are somewhat less invested or less embedded or less integrated into these sort of conservative linguistic standards and linguistic norms. But as we age, perhaps as we become socialized in professional uh, workspaces and, and other kinds of things, we seem to become more normative and, and begin rating non-standard varieties, particularly foreign and working, foreign ethnic and working class varieties uh, more, more negatively. So those are the, the major findings of, of the label study and give us a, a basic idea of what is the, the sort of ideological landscape of language attitudes in, in the UK today. Just a few further observations about this. I'm not going to go through these additional uh, uh, factors in detail, but uh, some other things that Bishop and colleagues also looked at and that we, we, we considered in our data set. We have some evidence of loyalty effects. So we see some in-group loyalty, again, in relation to these accent co concepts. So respondents um, in, in Scotland and in, in uh, the West Country and in Wales 
showed some evidence of preferring their accent over others, so an in-group kind of loyalty. And we also found an out-group bias effect, particularly among Scottish respondents who tended to uh, dislike English accents in particularly much more than, than various Scottish accents. But then we also found some self-directed bias. So respondents in, in Swansea and Belfast and in the Black country all downgraded accents, even though uh, those, those were their own accents as well, or reported to be their own accents as well. We found an effect of, of uh, stance towards diversity. So people who had a more positive stance towards diversity generally, uh, and linguistic diversity in particular, they rated all of the accent concepts more highly. Interestingly, we found no real uh, gender effect in our data, and this was a very strong effect in, in the Bishop et al. study from 2004, where previously women uh, were shown to be rating all of the accent concepts more highly than men. We didn't have any significant gender effects, so it, it's, it's interesting to think about what that might mean, if anything. And we didn't examine ethnicity because we were really focused on just replicating the Bishop et al. study and they hadn't looked at ethnicity. But we do know that um, Black listeners gave the highest uh, ratings to the various accent concepts, whereas white listeners gave, or I should say respondents as opposed to listeners, white respondents gave the lowest ratings overall. Okay, so that's the overview of what's happening in terms of the, the label study and the main moral there is that we're seeing this, this very stable, long-standing hierarchy of prestige that puts a sort of standard and inner circle varieties of English at the top of the hierarchy and industrial, uh, ethnic, and, and working class varieties at the bottom of the hierarchy. But as Bishop et al. say, we know that conceptual accent evaluation, so just being asked, what do you think of Birmingham English, for example, potentially taps into deeply conservative ideologies of language and may obscure more subtle social psychological shifts over time, as well as specific contextual effects. So in the next study that I'm going to be talking about, we wanted to investigate whether such accent preferences are equally evident when we're looking at audio stimuli, and in relation to an actual person, so when, you're, when respondents are hearing an actual voice and within a specific situated context. So in order to investigate this in the second study, um, which I'll be calling the Attitudes to Voices study, <clears throat> we conducted a verbal guise experiment, once again with a representative sample of the population in the UK. I'm only gonna be showing you results from, the, from a representative population of England uh, today. So it's just under 850 respondents. And what all of these respondents um, were doing was they were evaluating the performance of mock interview candidates. And they were told that these, the, what they were going to be hearing were candidates for a trainee solicitor position at a, a major corporate law firm in the UK. So a trainee so solicitor position is sort of entry level uh, in a law firm. They've all qualified to be solicitors and now they're, they're moving in for their first job. The candidates were all young men who were native speakers of five accents of English, and there were two speakers per accent. So we were testing uh, speakers of received pronunciation, the national standard, estuary English, uh, sort of contemporary non-standard variety um, that's associated with uh, the home counties and the southeast of England, multicultural London English, uh, also a contemporary non-standard variety, but much more associated with inner London, and in particularly with non-white and or multi-ethnic speakers. Um, general Northern English as the middle-class variety spoken in the North of England, and then urban West Yorkshire English as a, a working class, a white working class variety also spoken in the, in the North of England. And we chose these five different accents precisely to look at these kinds of contrasts in terms of region, North, South, social class, middle class, working class, and then uh, within the Southern working class between white and multi-ethnic variety. Now the stimuli um, themselves that the listeners were hearing were audio responses to interview questions. And we developed these interview questions with a lawyers who were part of the advisory board of the project. And so there were questions that would normally be asked in, in an interview for this kind of trainee solicitor position. And some of the questions require the candidate to have legal expertise, and we're going to be calling those expert questions, and others were just more focused on general professional skills. And I didn't test this, I should have, but let me see if I can play a very brief uh, extract of this. So this is RP. I worked as a part-time shop manager. This is Estuary English. I worked as a part-time shop manager. This is Multicultural London English. I worked as a part-time shop manager. This is General Northern English. 
I worked as a part-time shop manager. And then this is Urban West Yorkshire English. I worked as a part-time shop manager. Perfect. I'm assuming you can hear that. I can't see you or anything, so I'm assuming that you can hear there's something in the chat. There's a lag in the replay. Could you please replay it? Sure. I worked as a part-time shop manager. Yeah, that's RP, Estuary. I worked as a part-time shop manager. Okay, Emily. I worked as a part-time shop manager. General Northern English. I worked as a part-time shop manager. And Urban West Yorkshire English. I worked as a part-time shop manager. Okay. <clears throat> what the listeners did, so they heard these, these uh, stimuli that were these interview responses or responses to interview questions. And they rated all of the 10 speakers, each speaker responding to a different question. Oh, it's my commentary overlaps with audio. Got it. Sorry, Nancy. Okay. Um, and then for each of them, they were rated, um, uh, they, were, they were asked these, these various questions about each response, basically trying to get a sense of both the quality of the response itself, a candidate's likelihood to succeed as a lawyer, and whether this is somebody that you would personally like to work with. In, in testing, initial testing of the responses, we saw that they were all uh, very highly correlated and, and loaded onto, onto the same factor. So the results that I'll show you will just be of a, a, a global sort of suitability for employment that, that is an average of these five different dimensions. After rating uh, the, the listeners, after rating each of the speakers, the listeners then provided information about their own social and linguistic backgrounds including uh, the region uh, that they grew up in, their gender, their age, their class, and information about their social networks, as well as information about their beliefs about social mobility in the UK, and in particular, whether they believe there, is, uh, there are obstacles to social mobility for people from different um, class and regional backgrounds, as well as um, their general motivation to control prejudicial reactions. And I'll talk about what that means uh, in a moment when I show you the results for that. Okay, so just to, to start things off, the first thing to note is that there, we did not find in, in the voices study any overall effective accent. So there is no main effective accent difference. You see, there's obviously, it seems like there are slight differences in ratings here between, for example, RP and SRA English and MLE, but those differences are not significant. And the reason why this, this simple main effect of accent is not significant is because we have a very strong interaction between accent and age. And essentially what we find is that for younger respondents, and again, the cutoff age here is right around 45. For respondents or listeners under the age of 45, there's no significant uh, difference in how they rate the accents and how they judge candidates with these speaking with these different accents. As the candidates become older, above the age of 45, significant differences begin to emerge. And what that difference is specifically is that candidates with, uh, who speak with an estuary English or multicultural London English accent are significantly downgraded with respect to the other three. So again, with identical content that they're providing, right? So this was all very controlled, uh, in a very controlled experimental setup. The content was identical. The only thing different was the accents. If a candidate is, is speaking with an estuary English or a multicultural London English accent, they're being seen as less suitable, judged as less suitable for employment in a law firm by these older listeners, by listeners over the age of 40. There are actually even uh, more complicated effects, and I realize that there's a lot going on in this slide, so let me just walk you through this very briefly. You'll remember that some of the responses uh, required expert legal knowledge or expert knowledge about the, the legal profession, while others were just more about general professional uh, skills. And what we've plotted here are the expert uh, responses to expert questions are in gray and responses to the non-expert questions are in gold. And you can see that there's a boost in ratings for all uh, listeners when uh, they're, they're listening to a candidate giving an expert response. So we do see an expertise boost, which is good. It seems that people are, are recognizing that, that this person has the relevant kind of training. And so that makes them seem more qualified for a particular job. But this expertise boost interacts both with the age and the region of the listener. And what we actually find is that for older listeners who are from the South and Midlands, 
even though there's an expertise boost overall, we still see the significant downgrading of estuary English and multicultural London English. So estuary, both of them, EE and MLE for older listeners in the South and just MLE for older listeners in the Midlands. So even though everybody's helped to a certain extent by, by um, expertise, expert content, uh, that doesn't fully overcome the bias effects for listeners, uh, older listeners in the South and Midlands. And then finally, the last pattern that I want to show you uh, in this study is in relation to this, this uh, factor, motivation to control the prejudiced response. Now, this is a, a, a psychological construct, and it refers to um, the extent to which people don't want to seem prejudiced in their interactions with others. So it's not a measure of the extent to which somebody actually holds prejudicial beliefs. It's about how important it is for them to seem like they're not prejudiced when interacting with others. And a, a great deal of research in social psychology has argued that this is actually a better predictor of discriminatory behavior. So here, um, respondents with high MCPR scores are, are in gray. Those with low MCPR scores are, are in gold. And what we see, as, as expected, is that if you have a high MCR, MCPR, if it's important for you not to seem uh, prejudiced, then you're rating all of the speakers more highly. And if you have a lower one, you're rating all of the speakers more uh, lowly or rating them lower. But nevertheless, once again, among these older respondents in the South and the Midlands, we see that this is interacting um, with MCPR. So for those of them, for those listeners who have low MCPR, so a low motivation to control the prejudicial response, we see this downgrading of estuary English and to a lesser degree, multicultural London English. So MCPR here does seem to be able to overcome accent bias effects, but those bias effects reappear for people who are not very committed to controlling uh, their prejudicial response. So just to summarize um, the data from this story, we see that there is once again a hierarchy of accent prestige as we saw in the, in the label study, but that, that hierarchy of prestige is mitigated, it seems, when it's in the context of audio stimuli in a mock interview setting, right? So we see milder effects, fewer differences among the accents than we did for the accent labels and less variability in the ratings. We also see that accent evaluations are moderated by respondent age, which once again, we take to be indicative of age grading rather than societal change over time, given the results that we had in the labels study. And finally, we see that uh, the accent bias effects themselves are mitigated by expert content, as well as by a listener's motivation to control the prejudiced response. So we are still finding bias, but it's more nuanced and it's, it is uh, sort of amenable to, to greater mitigation than what we found in the labels. So overall then we see that hearing real voices in a situation with real content consequences like an interview shows bias, but to a reduced extent as compared to the accent label study. And then our final question is, are these milder biases found equally among professional recruiters? And when we ask recruiters to focus on response quality, and within a real workplace setting. So to investigate this in the third uh, workplace study, we repeated the verbal guise uh, experiment, but this time with lawyers and legal recruiters. And we did this via field work in commercial law firms in London, Leeds, and York. So we actually went into the law firms and, and ran the experiment with people whose job it is to, to recruit candidates for training solicitor positions. So what they were hearing once again was these, these mock interview performances. It is the same candidates with the same five accents. But unlike in the voices study, here all 10 questions required technical expertise. So we didn't include any of the questions that were just about general professional skills. And we did this because we also wanted to, to see whether the quality of the response, the actual quality of the content, had an effect. So we varied the quality of the response. We developed, again, with the lawyers on our advisory board, we developed better and worse responses to, to the interview questions. These were all pre-tested and really showed that, that this is a, sort of an objectively better answer to this question than this one. And we did this to avoid uh, the possibility that, that these you know, people who have experience doing precisely this kind of work would not simply upvote non-standard accents, for example, and that they really had to focus on judging the quality of, of the answer that was given. Okay, so what do we find? Well, interestingly, here you have the, the good answers are in gray and the poor answers are in gold, and we find no effect of accent 
Uh, so there's no statistically significant difference in overall ratings across the five accents. Instead, the lawyers that we tested were very, very good at simply identifying whether this was an objectively good response or a bad response. Now, this is interesting because it seems to indicate that, that within this context, in the workplace, these lawyer raters are able to ignore irrelevant information and really just focus on the task at hand. And we don't take this to indicate that lawyers are unbiased. We don't think that's the case. And actually, if we look at lawyers within the nationwide voices survey, so the survey I showed you before, because we did have lawyers within that panel as well, if I just go in and focus on the lawyers and other professionals in that uh, first study or the, the other study that I was showing you, they show precisely the same pattern as the rest of, of the nationwide uh, sample population. But when they're in a workplace, and when they're asked to focus specifically on this quality manipulation, any effects of accent bias disappear. And that's what we think is, is interesting in this final uh, workplace study. So we see no evidence of bias among lawyers in the workplace. Instead, we see that quality of response appears to be the only factor that determines uh, evaluative outcomes. And we don't therefore conclude that lawyers have no bias, but rather that these biases can be controlled. And we think that they're controlled because these lawyers were presented with the task in a very situated context and while they were engaged in a particular kind of goal-directed behavior. Okay, so if we try and summarize these three studies and put them all together, we see that we started with the accent label study, where we see the most differentiation across uh, the different access, uh, accents and the sort of strictest hierarchy, the most rigid hierarchy of the accents. When we move into the voices study, we still have distinctions, but they're fewer and milder, but we're still finding bias against Southern uh, working class accents. And then finally, in the workplace study, no distinctions. And it really seems that the, the respondents here are able to simply focus on objective quality differences. And when we think of what's happening across these studies, what is different and why won't you be getting these different results, Really, the move from the label study to the voices study is a process of contextualization. So we've moved from these very decontextualized ideological constructs in Birmingham English, received pronunciation, and so on, to hearing a voice in a particular kind of social context. And that seems to have an attenuating effect on the overall structure of the, of the bias patterns that we're finding. And then when we move from voices to the workplace, we're getting a sort of further contextualization. We also have expert raters here, so people bringing their expertise to, to, to bear on the task, and they have a very specific task that they need to be focusing on. So in terms of putting this all together and thinking, how can we make sense of this progression across the different studies? We found it useful to think about this in relation to the theory of planned behavior, which is, is a very well-known uh, social psychological model for thinking through how people make different kinds of behavioral decisions. And the centerpiece of, of the theory of planned behavior is that the primary determinant of any behavioral outcome is first a behavioral intention, so an intention to behave in a particular way. And the behavioral intentions themselves are determined by three things, attitudes toward a behavior, the subjective norms that, that uh, exist in relation to that behavior, and then an individual's own perceived ability to control that behavior. And when we think about the label study to begin with, there actually isn't a behavior here. This is just what, what, what uh, social psychologists would call a general attitude that's decontextualized from any specific behavioral outcome. And so it's not as sensitive to norms or control and, and really just reflects the ideological landscape of, of accents in the UK. But when we move to voices, here we are linking to a specific behavior. It's an action of hiring in the context of an interview. And there's a target of the person, the candidate speaking. And so we would anticipate that uh, these, these ideas of subjective norms and perceived behavioral control would play a larger role. And hence, we would find these more attenuated uh, patterns of bias as we do. And then finally, when we move to the workplace, workplace, we have an even more direct link to behavior, sharper norms for conduct among respondents who are actually very much enmeshed within in that particular environment, and also who have enhanced perceived control over their ability to, to control any biased or discriminatory outcomes. 
And so we think that the theory of planned behavior doesn't necessarily radically change the way that we're thinking of the relationship of the three studies, but it's, it's nice because it provides a sort of unified framework for us to think of this progression across different contexts. And it also allows us to think of how can we go about designing and testing different kinds of anti-bias interventions. I mean, really both what the theory of planned behavior would, would predict and what we seem to be finding is that when you heighten someone's perceived behavioral control or when you make people aware of subjective norms of behavior, they are then able to suppress their, their biased beliefs and so hopefully lead to a less discriminatory outcome. And sort of the moral then that we would want to promote with this is that it's not necessarily about uh, getting people to change their attitudes, which lots of research has shown is a very difficult thing to do, but rather getting them to change the behaviors that result from those attitudes or the behaviors that result. And that can be done by uh, targeting subjective norms and perceived behavioral control. And it's precisely in relation to this, just to wrap up, that I think the, um, the law that was that is currently making its way through through the French uh, parliamentary system, so I believe it's now in the Senate, having gone through the first reading in the Assemblée Nationale, and it's now in the Senate, um, which essentially makes accent discrimination a, a, a crime. Um, I think that that has a benefit in that it, it, it makes people aware of this as an issue. It changes the subjective norms that, that sit around the idea of, of accent discrimination and actually uh, indicates to people that they can control this, that they don't need to do it. And so both in terms of our research and in terms of what the theory of planned behavior would predict, it seems like this is a, a positive thing to do for, for these reasons. And I'd be very happy to talk about that in more detail. Um, oh, right. I do was going to tell you briefly about, I, I have no idea of how long I've been talking. I'll just wrap up quickly. Um, let me tell you briefly um, about the, uh, the interventions that we did actually test as well. So we, we tested uh, a variety of different interventions. These interventions were all based on um, uh, proposals that have been made in the social psychology literature over the years about ways in which we can control or try to control discrimination. In, in different sectors. Uh, so one was is simply raising awareness about uh, the existence of a particular pattern of bias, making people aware that this can happen. Another one was identifying irrelevant information. So this is specifically within the context of, of employment, where before, uh, uh, say, an employment panel, you have all the panelists sit down and decide what is relevant for the post, what is not relevant to the post, and make these very explicit statements. You know, I will not consider this list of irrelevant things. Um, a third intervention was getting people to commit uh, explicitly again before, before an employment task to being fair and objective and defining what fair and objective means. Another was increasing accountability, so telling people that they would have to justify their, their hiring decisions to, say, a superior, and they would have to list the reasons for, for all the decisions that they made. And then finally, a more general appeal to multiculturalism and diversity. And again, these are all things that have been proposed in the psychology literature as, as potential anti-bias interventions. So we tested all of these using a similar kind of task. So people also uh, listening to and rating the different candidates that, that we use in our, in our voices and workplace studies, just some of them preceded by this kind of intervention versus a control condition. And what we found was that really the only uh, intervention that had any kind of effect was raising awareness, but it did have a very significant effect. So we saw that simply mentioning that accent bias exists and that accent bias can lead to discriminatory outcomes resulted in many fewer differences uh, across the different accents that were being rated. So even the more nuanced differences that we identified in the, in the voices study disappeared when, when candidates were told uh, about accent bias as a potential problem beforehand. And so again, it does seem that this kind of raising awareness, which again, I, would, I, I believe that the French law is trying to, to, to target, would be an effective, potentially effective strategy. Thank you very much. That's great, thank you. It was very clear, very informative and interesting uh, research. Please do feel free to put your questions in the chat now. If you have something you'd like to ask yourself, you can also use the raise hand function or just note in the chat that you'd like to uh, unmute and ask a question. While we wait for those questions to come in, 
Uh, can I just ask if you know about what's happening in the legal context now and whether there is evidence of an accent bias in the hiring? So, are, you know, the lawyers you show do have this ability to turn that off, but are they actually doing that currently or is there bias in hiring? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. So, so yeah, we, we were able to show, uh, sorry, in these very, in the sort of very controlled experimental context, they can they can turn it off and they can just sort of focus on the task. But all evidence, uh, both uh, sort of within their own internal reporting and anecdotal evidence seems to show that, no, they're not necessarily turning that off in actual hiring processes. So this hasn't really translated into the real world. There are, There is what I would assume, I mean, it's difficult to know whether it's specifically accent because nobody's actually tested this in, in sort of real world situations. Um, but there are and there remain uh, huge disparities in terms of who is, is accessing employment in the legal profession. And then there are also questions, you know, we talk to a lot of lawyers is, as part of this project, um, both informally and then we've also presented our results in, in a number of different law firms. And we've had, um, you know, sort of testimonials from a lot of people who said too that, you know, you might be able to get your foot in the door, so get hired as a trainee solicitor, but then would you get promoted? Would you be able to also move up in, in, in the sort of seniority within the firm? That also then becomes a different question. So I do think that accent bias is, is a very real issue, even if, you know, we've shown that the lawyers can turn it off. I don't think that necessarily means that they do do that in their everyday life. Yeah, I guess that speaks also to this idea of raising awareness has a very temporary effect, right? It doesn't, it doesn't actually change the attitudes long term. Well, yeah, and that's another question. And I think that's something that's really open to, to um, investigation. So how long do these kinds of interventions last? Is this something that needs to happen, say, before every hiring panel? Do you need to remind people of these things? I think there's some evidence that, I mean, there, so there have been studies that have shown that um, raising awareness of things like um, racial and ethnic discrimination or gender discrimination are no longer that effective. And we wonder whether that's just because there's, there's been a sort of saturation kind of effect where people are like, yeah, I know about this. I'm not gonna pay attention to it anymore. We do wonder whether accent is sort of a novel thing that a lot of people don't think about. And so might have, might for that reason be, be more effective at the moment, but absolutely the, the sort of persistent uh, persistence of that effect is, is, a, is a very good question and an open question. Right. Let me turn to a question from Haroon. Haroon asks, about the uh, French accent in English. Do you know why French accent in English has become one of the most positively evaluated varieties in the UK? Yeah, no idea. I have no idea where that came from. I mean, it was always, it was always positively evaluated before. So even in the 2004 study, I believe it was in, in ninth place and has now moved up to third. But yeah, I, I, I don't really have a good response for why that, why that might be. I mean, it is a strange That's exception because nice yeah, it's largely anti-foreign accent, anti sort of non seen as you know local British accent, or usually has a negative bias. So it's yeah, yeah, a strange. Thing. It's true. I don't know. Maybe it's linked to even though I mean these these were nationwide. I mean there has been a huge uh, sort of wave of, of migration from France to to the UK. I don't know if maybe since since two thousand and four, but certainly I know that London is. I mean, would people say that London is the the third or fourth French city in terms of population, something like 400,000 French people living in London. So it could potentially be linked to that, but I'm really just speaking off the top of my head. I don't, I don't have a good answer for that, but it is interesting. Okay, we have a, a question in the chat from Marie. I'll, I'll read it out for you. Uh, the question is, uh, you showed an age effect in the responses for evaluating the pleasantness of the accents before 45 people favoring foreign accents versus above 45 favoring national accents. You said that it could be the result of a change at midlife where people feel more connected to their national roots. Do you think it could also be the result of a stronger exposure to a wider range of foreign accents in the younger generations through social media or else that contributed to uh, shape differently their acceptance of language variety? Would it be possible to test that, maybe comparing age-related attitudes towards accents with earlier studies? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. So I, yeah, I, I don't necessarily think that it's people feeling more connected to their national roots uh, post 45. I think that the argument that, that we're making is that it's more people becoming more normative. So in a sense, becoming more, um, I guess this is linked to feeling connected to your national roots, but being more invested and or socialized into what is the overall uh, hierarchy of prestige that, that exists in a particular place or in the UK. 
And interestingly, I mean, it's a very interesting question. Is this sort of a change? Is this linked to exposure to, to things via social media and, and other kinds of exposure? And we don't think so because uh, Coupland and, and, and Bishop and colleagues in their 2004 study found a very similar pattern. So they also found that, that younger people were more open and, and favoring of, of both foreign and non-standard accents in 2004, whereas older people were more favoring of, of these sort of national standard varieties. And then we're finding exactly the same thing 15 years later. So really, the people who were the young people in, in uh, Coupland and Bishop's study are now sitting on, could potentially be sitting on the, in the older people group in our study, and they seem to have changed. So that's why we really think that this is an age grading as opposed to a, a pattern of change. Uh, there's actually a second question from Harun who was asking a bit about the, the social background of the listeners that you're looking at. And I wonder if, if you were, uh, say, including listeners who were first generation immigrants, would you expect similar results that when they re reach a certain age, their attitudes start to shift and they have negative evaluations of certain ways of speaking? Yeah, no, that's a very interesting question. So all of the listeners that we are testing here are people who listed themselves as uh, I'm trying to remember how we phrase this in the question, but they were all, um, I think we said spoke a British variety of English as a native language was how we put it. So that it predominantly, I mean, we do have all of this information about well, where people were born, where they lived and other languages that they speak, um, but they all spoke a variety of British English as a native language and the majority of them were born in the UK and the majority of them were, were monolingual. In terms of other aspects of their social background, we don't have, uh, well, we do actually have all of their, yeah, we have their, their sort of social class information, we have information about um, race and ethnic distribution and things like that. We did run all these, um, and none of that uh, ended up showing any significant effects. So, so people's own social class, which we, we were classifying in terms of a parents' occupation and income, um, and, and as well as ethnic differences, we didn't find any differences in, in the listener population. I'll read a, a comment and a question from uh, Nancy. Uh, first, right, thank you, Ares. So interesting, especially in the context of undergraduate student recruitment in Oxbridge. I think that could be explored. And then a question was, how many legal listeners did you have for the workplace exercise mm -hmm. and how did you select them? Did any of them refuse to participate after you approached them? Yeah, so in, in relation to the, the Oxbridge comment and just higher education in general, absolutely. And this is definitely an area, area that we would be interested in, in looking at. We, we sort of, we had to pick a sector to focus on and, and we chose law for, for a variety of reasons. But we had also considered uh, finance, we had thought about medicine, and we had thought about um, higher education. But I absolutely agree, particularly when one sees the statistics about sort of school leavers with, with equal uh, qualifications, then you know, and then you look at the proportions of who is actually getting into Oxbridge or not. And when you know that one of the last stages, when you know, even if you have these these wonderful A level results and things like that, then you have to go for interview. So it seems to me that there might be a lot happening in that interview that that is then resulting in in these disparities that we see in in sort of the elite um, uh, higher education institutions. So I absolutely think that that would be a very interesting place to look. In terms of the legal uh, listeners, so the, the lawyers and the, and the professional, uh, the legal recruiters, it was difficult to access them. So in the end, we only got 61. We had originally been, been aiming for about double that for 120. We worked with 12 different law firms um, and the firms were very open to the idea. The way that we sort of got in was going via the, the recruitment uh, departments within firms who were very invested in questions of diversity um, and inclusion. And so there were lots of firms that wanted to work with us, but then actually getting lawyers within firms to, to participate in the study was much more difficult. Partially, I think that's because they're, they're, they're very busy um, lawyers and so it's, it's, it's not easy for them. And that's why we tried to make it as easy as possible. So essentially our, our, our research assistants would just sort of be sitting in the firm all day long and people could drop by and do the experiment whenever they had a chance. But we only ended up having um, 61. We never had anyone who refused to participate. Um, it, was, it was very voluntary. There were sent messages um, by the, the sort of administrators in the firm saying that we are here doing this study. If people want to, to participate, they can do so. But, um, but it was difficult to, to, to recruit.
And then Julia made a comment that it would be interesting to include Polish accents. Did you consider that or other European accents or were there others that you considered but just couldn't include? Yeah, so we decided for the Voices in the Workplace study to, to just focus on, uh, on regional varieties, sort of regional and social varieties of, of uh, British accents. Um, but it would definitely be very interesting to, to also be then looking at various kinds of, of non-native uh, varieties of English as well, because there certainly are, are other patterns there. You know, we've been talking, for example, now we've, we've been talking with colleagues in the medical school at Queen Mary about potentially also extending this kind of work into medical uh, education, uh, and yeah, sort of medical, medical education and medical employment, and they're including um, uh, non-British varieties as well. If there's any more questions, feel free to uh, put that in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, I will pass on one question I received from a master's student uh, at SOAS who uh, had a previous career as a lawyer. And so I uh, was curious about this aspect of the study. And he was wondering if there was any effect of say like, the like a marketing effect where lawyers are also aware that their clients will have these biases and they may yeah. want to hire people who you know put forward a certain image that looks good to clients so even if you know you reduce the bias in the lawyers themselves they become aware of it might they still want to hire a certain kind of person to get a certain kind of client yeah absolutely and this is something that we talk to lawyers and law firms a lot about because it's something that a lot of lawyers brought up um, that they're, you know, they would be worried about client expectations. But what's interesting there is that we actually think in, that there's a disconnect between what lawyers think clients want and what clients actually want. Because then when you look on the client side, there are more and more sort of large companies that are now resigning firms that they don't feel are diverse enough or putting various kinds of diversity criteria on the firms that they contract. So if, if, we're going to, you know, these are large firms like Unilever, uh, large companies. If we're going to give you our business, then you need to show that you meet these various diversity benchmarks. So it's actually unclear to us whether this is an actual demand from clients or whether this is a sort of imagined demand that lawyers have. But it certainly plays into the equation. And we, we also had, um, you know, some, some lawyers that we spoke with say things like, yes, I would hire a person with this accent, no problem, but I would never put them in front of a client. So I would hire them and they could do back office work. Interesting. Uh, we have a hand raised. Uh, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, I think you're still muted. Yeah, you're still muted there. Hello. Yes, um, my apologies for that. Um, That's right. yes, I remember reading some years ago about some um, research done um, by commercial companies who wanted to um, for, to establish what would be the most trustworthy voices for uh, people to do radio or television commercials, particularly radio mm -hmm. commercials and uh, finding sort of results were very different from some of the ones that you found in your studies. Mm -hmm. and I wondered if, if you'd uh, done any sort of comparative work uh, on that. I remember that some Irish accents were considered to be extremely trustworthy for certain types of, of commercial advertising on radio. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So you, yeah, you just, I think the general pattern is it's, it's Irish, it's Northern, sort of the North of England accents that are, that are considered very um, likable and, and trustworthy as these things. And we did see those patterns in the label study when we were looking at the, the pleasantness results that I didn't, I didn't show here at all. But we basically replicated that, these kinds of patterns that have been reported. Mm. That. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great, well, I think all our questions have been answered. There's also many people writing thank you in the chat for uh, sharing. Um, thank you from uh, me as well on behalf of SOAS for being willing to come and show your research. We hope this will have some positive impact in uh, society as well and that some yeah. recommendations will begin to make a difference and raise, raise awareness where that's possible. So thank you for yeah. joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for, for coming. All right. Thank, thank you everyone. You.